comrades and friends, it is so incredible to be here with you all. Thank you so much for having Socialist Alternative as part of your important rally. And I am so thrilled to bring you solidarity from the US working class and revolutionary greetings from Socialist Alternative. which is the American section of the Committee for a Workers International and in solidarity with the Socialist Party here. As others have said, it was a landmark event that Trump was elected an open, bigot, right-wing, uh, racist, misogynist, uh, a worker hater, and by his election, there is no question that the right wing in the United States is emboldened. However, we would be making a historical mistake if we concluded from that that the United States, the working class of the United States was moving rightward. Because as a matter of fact, as Sarah said, this is really an indication of an era of social upheaval, an era of sharp polarization. Because alongside Trump's election, we have also seen massive protests like they haven't been seen in some of our lifetimes. We have seen a rebirth of activism in the United States with a new layer of young people moving into struggle such as has not been seen in the last 40 years. We saw the biggest ever single day of protests in the US history the day after <coughs> Trump's election, <coughs> sorry, in 2016 and we saw massive student walkouts that same day. Sorry. <coughs> and more recently, more recently, we have seen the Me Too struggle really come into its own in many ways through the street expression of young women, young women with a militant voice against the Kavanaugh appointment. And while the Kavanaugh appointment did go through and the protests were ultimately unsuccessful. The Me Too struggle that came out on the streets against Kavanaugh had the appointment of a Supreme Court justice hanging by a thread. And the ramming through of Kavanaugh has led many young women and working women to draw more far-reaching conclusions about the bankruptcy of the institutions of US capitalism. We saw the enormous protests, one day protests internationally by Google workers a few days ago. 20,000 Google workers walked out, starting with my home country, India, and then going on at 11 a.m. Having coordinated protests at 11 a.m. on every continent from Mumbai to Zurich to London to Dublin and then to New York City and Seattle and Mountain View, the headquarters of Google. The workers fighting against sexual harassment on the workplace, demanding an end to forced arbitration and also demanding equal pay for equal work. And just yesterday, we've heard that the workers won their victory on their first demand, which is an end to forced arbitration on sexual harassment cases. <laughs> what is even more striking about the Google uh, walkout is that they cited the workers, these are tech workers, extremely well paid, very well educated, coming from some of the privileged, most privileged layers, they said, that they were inspired to take action by the Me Too struggle and by McDonald's workers who last month engaged. <laughs> engaged in a one day work stoppage against sexual harassment. Comrades, what, a, what an incredible thread of history is woven by working class people that some of the most oppressed workers who work at McDonald's are able to inspire some of the most privileged workers in Google and, and really encourage, uh, you know, an, encourage a real action, workplace action on many issues that are related to identity. 
But we have seen such tectonic shifts on the labor movement in the United States. As many of us have said before, we are seeing the reawakening of a sleeping giant of the US working class. And what more tremendous example can there be this year of that than the nine day illegal wildcat strike by the teachers in West Virginia? West Virginia was one of two states for which every county voted for Trump. We could make the mistake of easily dismissing them as a red state, conservative people, no hope. But this was the state in which not only did they have a successful strike action, but that strike action by teachers ignited a wave of strike actions and resistance by teachers in blue states like my state in Washington. These are teachers who led a militant rank and file struggle that stood up against a bankrupt and rotten leadership and provided a fighting strategy, an alternative to the cautious and ineffective and ultimately betrayal of business unionism, providing class struggle as an alternative to class snuggle, which is collaboration with the bosses. <laughs> important indications of the times we live in and the true consciousness of American working class people is the growth of the openness to socialist ideas. When we won the first election in 2013, bourgeois commentators, many Democratic Party operatives, wanted to dismiss it as some sort of idiosyncratic, some unique thing that can happen only in Seattle because it's a strange left-wing city. But we are now seeing the rise, the incredible explosion of membership in the Democratic Socialists of America, with a record number of candidates running as self-described socialists. And Sarah mentioned the tremendous convention that Socialist Alternative just had. And Socialist Alternative has not just grown in the past period, but it has grown with a decisive working class character, with uh, everywhere from bartenders to waitresses to tech workers joining the organization because they recognize how important it is to develop the Marxist movement. So at this moment, comrades and friends, in the United States and also globally, I would say, the question is not, should we fight the right wing? The question is, how will we fight the right wing and how will we defeat them? And that is why analysis matters, and then action based on that analysis matters. The analysis of socialist alternative is that Trump, who was a known predator, who was elected as a predator in chief, was that happened as an expression of the most predatory phase of American capitalism, of huge anger against the status quo, against establishment uh, politics, and a complete and utter disgust at the corruption of politics in the United States. Trump dishonestly ran as a representative of the so-called forgotten men and women, by which he meant the enormous working class layers that have been left out of the, uh, the lion's share of prosperity that has been seen in the last many decades. Trump, we know, is a con man and in reality has represented the billionaire class in office, and there's example after example of that. But with Clinton standing for a continuation of status quo corporate politics, and with Bernie Sanders out of the race, Trump was able to narrowly win in spite of losing the popular vote by posing as a candidate for the people. And this conclusion, correct conclusion, that the election of Trump was a rejection of establishment politics and of corruption has been furiously, furiously resisted by the Democratic Party leadership. But even they are having to look seriously at their own program by the midterm election results, as Peter and others have mentioned, was a decisive and pronounced indictment of Trump's politics. And yes, it was not a massive blue wave in the way that 
people would have liked to see, and there's a little bit of confusion about what the results actually represent. However, and, and you can see bourgeois media and, and uh, pro-democratic party media saying that this confirms moderation is the way to go, and you know, which we, of course we don't agree with that. Um, what we are seeing in the midterm results is that even though the Republicans continue to make a few gains, what stands out is that despite the fact that the Democratic establishment has failed to provide any real alternative to the working class, the working class went to the polls in record numbers in many counties breaking the record for voter turnout because they wanted their vote to represent a rejection of Trump and the right wing. We saw three states pass minimum wage increases. Three cities in California passed a tax on big business. We saw through a ballot initiative in Florida, one of the states that is often dismissed as conservative, 1.5 million people with felony charges being given the right to vote, which is an indictment of the mass incarceration and racist system in the US. And we saw the election of self-proclaimed socialists like Rashida Tlaib, who is a DSA candidate who is now in Congress, Julia Salazar, who is a DSA member, who is now in the New York State Senate, and also Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is going into Congress. But comrades and friends, this poses the question of what the Democratic Party actually is going to do. Because the majority is hungry for a fundamental shift from the misery that is on offer to them every single day. So the Democrats are going to be put to the test, both establishment Democrats in terms of how out of touch they persist in remaining from the voice of their own base, but also the left wing and even uh, you know, socialist candidates who have been elected to the, to the Democratic Party will be put to the test because while there, there will be what we call a so-called honeymoon period for them, that is not going to be eternal because the American working class is impatient and is looking for serious change. And we know that is not going to come from Nancy Pelosi, who has declared that Congress will now become a bipartisan marketplace of ideas. <laughs> And, and you know, and, and, and if you know anything in America, you, you will know that bipartisan means screw the working class. <laughs> and she has refused to, to even take up the question of impeaching Trump. Tied to all of this, comrades and friends, is also the important question of what happens in the labor movement. Because one of the reasons the Democratic Party have such a stranglehold against the creation of a real left alternative is how tied at the hip the labor bureaucracy is to the democratic establishment. And so this brings up the question of how effectively the rank and file in the neighbor, labor movement are going to be willing and you know, are they going to really clash with their own leaders just like the West Virginia teachers did. So nothing is certain but there is a put huge potential such as has never exist, existed before. There are also the questions of whether or not to participate in the elections in the first place. Understandably, there is a lot of questioning among young people because when they see the Republicans and the Democrats and no real choice on offer other than some real differences on social issues, but no choice, no, no real choice on changing lives in any way, understandably young people can draw the conclusion that maybe electoral politics itself is defunct and you know, what we need to do is build movements on the streets. And there is no doubt a uh, serious truth in the fact that the, social, the backbone of social movements are going to be movements on the streets and struggles in the workplace because electoral politics in the way that it is posed in the bourgeois context, especially in the United States, is not the most fertile ground for making change. However, we should not make the mistake of rejecting electoral questions altogether because we have shown that in reality, what we need is to, we have shown in Seattle that in reality, what the working class needs is for mass movements to really ignite the working class nationally, but through those movements, having our own independent candidates elected who can pose a serious alternative to 
the Democratic Party and show that the way forward does not lie from inside the Democratic Party, but by building independent political organizations and ultimately looking towards a revolutionary party for the American working class. As Peter said, our fight for 15 did not remain limited to Seattle, but really started a trend nationwide. And our 15 Now movement that began in Seattle has gone nationwide. But we, we won this in Seattle not by relying on the goodwill of other elected Democrats and the Democratic Party you know, lobbyists and so on, or backroom negotiations. We won that by defiantly and openly rejecting that kind of approach and saying, no, we're going to go to the streets, we're going to go to the doors, we're going to go to the working class of Seattle that we know needs to be empowered to win this because it is absolutely ludicrous to put our faith in big business and the politicians that serve them. But this was important because in America, there is the, you know, the, the bourgeois parties have uh, have created this idea, it's a mythical idea, but it's, it's an idea that is pervasive, that it's all fine and good when you're an activist, but once you get elected, you need to work with the system. You need to behave yourself. <sighs> you need to behave yourself, be nice. And we have, we have often confronted that by saying that being nice to the establishment means only one thing, betraying the interests of the working class. Yeah. And we have used that approach not just to win $15 an hour. We have won a whole host of renters' rights and through the people's budget movement have won serious victories, but not just the victories, but have really mobilized working class people to fight for themselves and to build organized resistance to, to build that fight. One of our arch enemies, a lead lobbyist for the landlord corporations, said when he retired last year, that every dollar that the landlord lobby spent in, on Seattle City Council was wasted because of the army of Sawant. And, <laughs> and, I think, and I think that is not a compliment to any individual. It is a recognition of the power that comes from organized working class movements that also have their own voice that builds with them inside City Hall. And this can be done inside the halls of Congress as well. And you know, sometimes your enemies give you the best compliments. <laughs> but we saw through the tax Amazon struggle that when you take on the might of the richest man in the world, it is not a straightforward struggle. And even though it was historically incredible that we won the tax, less than a month later, it was repealed by seven of the nine council members on the Seattle City Council. They were all Democrats. Shame. Absolutely cowardly, shameful capitulation. But the lesson from this is precisely what Socialist Alternative has been saying, that you cannot rely on politicians, even if they might be well-meaning, and some of them are, because if they base themselves on the strategy of backroom negotiations, rather than coming out and standing with the movement, then it is not going to be possible to actually fight for working people. We saw that, of course, in a much more amplified way through the betrayals of Syriza that Juan Ignacio mentioned. So I will close on this, comrades and friends. The working class socialist young people today have an enormous responsibility on our shoulders to defeat the right wing, it's attacks on immigrants, women, LGBTQ people, attacks on workers and the labor movement. But to do so in the United States and globally, we will need to build ongoing mass movements, but also raise the question of working class parties that are independent of corporate money and corporate power. Because time is short. Across the world, we see billions relegated to poverty and misery. 
in Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, this, this year on the West Coast in this, this summer, we saw unprecedented wildfires that brought to life, literally in front of your eyes, the crisis of climate change. And we have seen capitalism's inability to even slow climate catastrophe, much less stop it. In its single-minded pursuit of profit, in the competition between multinationals based in different countries, furiously fighting against regulation that could slow climate change. So as the human costs become greater and greater, the urgency of building not only mass movements, but the Marxist leadership of these movements becomes ever more urgent. As we know, the only viable alternative is the leadership of the working, cl working class through a revolutionary movement. And for that to happen, we will need to build the Socialist Party here, Socialist Alternative in the United States, IR in the sp uh, Spanish state, and so on and so forth. We will need a Marxist movement on every continent. And I will also make an appeal here. As Peter said, our election next year in Seattle is of uh, you know, is of global significance because it will be an almighty battle against the capitalist class in the U.S. And our election will be a referendum on one single question. Who controls Seattle? Is it Amazon and billionaires like Bezos or is it the working class? And we want the correct answer to that question by winning the election. Onward to world socialism. Thank you.